It's Comics Are Great, the visual storytelling show recorded live Wednesdays at the Ann Arbor District Library in lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan, comics.aadl.org. And this is the show where we talk about making comics, writing comics, drawing comics, coloring comics, designing comics, and the lifestyle of cartoonists, all the stuff that surrounds this medium that drives us all mad. My name is Jersey Drozd, cartoonist and teaching artist. And uh, with me today, with a uh, special guest, so special, I'm so excited to have him back, uh, Zach Giolongo. Hey, Zach. Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> the camera anyway. the camera drops the moment we switch to you. Hey, Zach Giolongo of yes. Zachulees.tumblr.com. Zachulees on uh, Instagram. The, Everywhere. The suitably authenticated Zach Giolongo Facebook page. Right. Uh, still in progress, ZachGiolongo.com. Yes. Sheepishly. <laughs> yes. So uh, and, and, and for those who want to go to the, uh, Zach Giolongo uh, dot com. It's G I A L L O N G O. Right. Uh, it's Gia with an A. What is that Italian? Yes. It is. It is. I swear this is not going to keep happening. I promise you. <laughs> this is my promise to you. <laughs> All right. So uh, no, no big. Like I said, it adds texture to the show. So oh, it adds texture. All right. So <laughs> it's, Zach is the uh, the cartoonist. Author, oh boy, author, such a loaded word, of this fabulous book called Broxo, which we've talked about in the show before. Uh, we got a couple things that we got to talk about when it comes to the work that you've done. We're going to establish your credentials before we dive into the discussion. Okay. Uh, and we're going to talk about talent versus effort this episode. All right. Uh, Broxo, which is a uh, barbarian boy uh, in the wilderness, uh, runs into a warrior princess. And they wind up fighting some restless spirits, which yes. are kind of like zombies, but kind of not like zombies. And uh, when we, we talked with you on episode 89 mm -hmm. about this, and you, you quoted a, a young reader who said, they're not really zombies, they're just mm -hmm. restless spirits that they're fighting That's right. in the story. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. By the way, I forgot that you were on episode 89. <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> I, I I emailed you. I'm like, I'm so glad I'm finally having you on the show that I went looking well, through. I, my... I got sort of confused. I was like, I I think I've done it. Maybe he just means video. Yeah. But also, because you know we've been on a few podcasts together. So I was like, well, maybe it's just in the shuffle there. He, right. you know, yeah, that's just me being just overtaxed. Uh, <laughs> but but yeah, like when I went through my notes, I'm like, wait a second, he's been on the show before because I remember talking yeah. about Broxo with him. But uh, first second published the book it's a fabulous book it's a terrific read it's one of my picks for this episode when we talk about book recommendations everybody should read it twice but that's not all you've done bro because no. you're also kind of a star wars fan uh you turned me on, turned yeah. me on to the the clone Wars series uh so you did a book about oh god did you really do a book about ewok zach why would you do that i did i did why would i do that uh because i love the ewoks i love them so i did a whole book about them they're, what, and, uh, they're the point when Star Wars went south, you know, because it's really supposed to be just Boba Fett driving a Corvette, shooting guns out of both windows while everything explodes behind him. That's what Star Wars is. We've talked about this. Now, Jersey. Yes. Now, Jersey, I know that you are straight up trolling me right now. <laughs> I know how you feel about these things. Uh, I'm just playing what they call devil's advocate. That's not trolling. Oh, all right. Okay. All right. No, actually, <laughs> that is trolling. But anyway, so it's, uh, yeah. Ewok Shadows of Endor was, I mean, dream project, right? I have a copy right? here. Yeah, can can we look at it? Yeah. Oh, so pretty. Yeah. And there's Wicket, there's Logre. They're so. all all your favorites are here. <laughs> so it's it's uh it actually for the, for those who haven't heard of this book, it actually ties together some Star Wars continuity and some of the cartoon continuity. Yes. Yeah, it sort of takes the Ewok cartoon and the two Ewok movies, if you remember those. Um, and Return of the Jedi and kind of uh, tries to make them all a little bit more cohesive. Um, so, so even if you don't like Ewoks, if you're like a Star Wars continuity nerd, this yeah. would be a book for you. Yeah. All right. So that, that, that was published by Dark Horse? Yes. Okay. So first, second, Dark Horse already. You got some great credentials behind you in terms of like backing backing by really excellent publishers. And then you got another one coming out or just came out, right? The oh, and End of September. End of September came out, and by the way, this I mean, this isn't a play, but this is a video production, so we will refer to it as the Scottish play, right? Mm-hmm. So this is the uh, Stratford Zoo Midnight Review. 
And what is what is this that just came out? Stratford Zoo Midnight Review presents. Well, I can't say the title, right? Yeah, the sky. We can show the title, maybe. We can show the title, but nobody say it. Okay. (laughs) The Scottish graphic novel. (laughs) Um, So what? This is a book that's uh, written by Ian Lendler and drawn by me. Um, The premise is that uh, these animals at the Stratford Zoo break out of their cages at night. And they put on Shakespeare plays. Because, you know, have you ever been to a zoo at night after hours? Uh, yeah, at the Toledo Zoo, they do a thing called the Lights Before Christmas where you can actually go at night. Um, okay. But but that's the only that's like a special event. Uh, right. But I've not been to a zoo at night on a regular day, so I have no idea what the animals do. So you don't know what happens. I don't. Well, this book aims to answer that question. <laughs> So it's, and it's that they put on Shakespeare plays. Animals yeah. doing people things, which I am always, always a big fan of. Right. Yes. <laughs> but um, you also draw really excellent animals doing people things, I should say. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I try, I try really hard. I mean, I like animals, and I always try. Like One of the things I did with this book is I said, okay, I don't want to just draw the same sort of – cartoon lion that everybody has seen or you know i didn't want to draw cartoon animals i started from the real animals and then kind of reverse engineered them um you know to suit a style that i'm comfortable working in and you worked on this with um the colorist uh Alyssa harris right Alyssa of cooking up comics.com another yes fab- indeed fabulous yep. cartoonist yeah, she she handled the colors for this and also for uh, the next one, which we're just putting the finishing touches on, which is Romeo and Juliet. Uh-huh. And that'll come out next year at some point. And who who published this again? Was this first second? This is first second also, yeah. Man, they just keep batting a thousand the first second. Uh, yeah, they're good. Yeah, they are good. They really, I mean, they continue to be the Pixar of comics, and I'm waiting for them to drop the ball at some point, and it just doesn't seem like they're gonna. Were you the one saying that... Uh, Throwing in cars in there for or for a metaphor was that you? <laughs> that was at New York Comic Con, yes. When okay, when, when I hijacked your panel, um, uh, oh, hijacked. Yes, Please. I, I came in and shouted a lot. Uh, but yeah, with you and, and Ben Hatke, you guys are the stars. I was just there to like just do a lot of color commentary. But okay, can I tell this story though? Can I can I can I hijack this and tell this Please. story? Sure. Okay, because this is you are a hero, my friend. Oh, whatever. So here's what happened. In a nutshell, Ben Hatke and I uh, of Zeta the Space Girl, also published by First Second, we were scheduled to do this uh, panel on Sunday morning at New York Comic Con, and it was a drawing panel. And the description just said, you know, uh, draw magical creatures with Zach and Ben. And we said, okay, it was at 10 a.m. And we said, well, who's moderating? And then we were told, oh, no, there's no moderator. And we kind of looked at each other like, all right, you kidding? (laughs) Okay. So we go down uh, for the panel, which was at 10 a.m. And we get down there, and the, one of the volunteers is standing in front of the door, and she says, oh, no, 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 the panels don't start till 1045. So Ben and I look at each other, and we're like, so this thing's not for another 45 minutes. You know, what do we do? We don't have a moderator. We're not sure what we're supposed to be doing. It's in 45 minutes. Plus, we'd had a group signing, um, a, a joint signing together at, like, 1130, which we didn't want to miss. Right. So we kind of do the uh, the 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 kids skipping school kind of thing. We kind of look at each other and say, well, maybe we can uh, maybe we can blow this off. Like maybe (laughs) maybe maybe no one will be here because it's early Sunday morning, you know, that kind of thing. So we leave and then we come back for 1045 and we look in and we're like, are all these people here for the magical drawing event? And almost like a movie, just as soon as we said that, this guy and his, like, three kids are like, is this drawing magical creatures with Zach and Ben? And she's like, yes. And we're like, oh, okay, we're in now. We're committed. <laughs> so it's like that scene in Strange Brew and the dad's like, what the heck am I supposed to tell him? <laughs> right. <laughs> so we walk in and we're kind of, you know, I mean, there's not even, like, uh, pads of paper, markers. We're not even sure. And suddenly there's a little vibration on my phone. And I look at it, and Mr. Jersey Droz has texted me and said, hey, what time's your panel? I want to see it. And I'm like, get here. Get here as fast as you can. I think I said, help me, Obi-Wan. help me, Obi-Wan, 
Kudrow's be or something, you're our only hope. So you start texting. You're like, okay, we're moving as fast as we can. You walk in, jacket, bag, and I think I grabbed you by the lapels and said, you're moderating this thing. <laughs> and you said, but you know what? You, you are a rock star because you were like, okay, you threw off the stuff and you were like, all right, and you immediately, like you took control of that room. You handled it because we had, we literally had nothing. We had nothing. And you came in there and you, we could not have done it without you. So thank you for that. Well, always happy to help you, Zach. (laughs) And, and I'm always happy to, uh, talk about my favorite cartoonists. So, um, oh, I'm getting some slapback from you all of a sudden. I wonder what's going on. Is there, is there something in front of the speakers on your, on your device? Uh, I don't know. Check one, two, check one, two. No, now it's gone. Okay, we're good. Now it's gone. Okay. But no, it was, it was a lot of fun. And, and the funny part was about my, my end of the story was I, as I was texting you to say like, hey, what time's your panel and where is it? I'm with Anne, my wife, and she says like, yeah. should you really be texting him just before the panel? He's probably getting ready for it. And I'm like, well, all he's, <laughs> and I was like, all he's got to do is just like send me a room number. You know, he knows it and I don't want, then I don't have to dig for it. Uh, and then as soon as I sent it, I was like, oh, now I feel kind of bad because I just gave him an extra stressor on top of everything else, you know. But uh, it all worked out. It was it was a fun it was a fun panel. So, it was it was, and and I thank you again. That was fantastic. Well, any any time, any day of the week. But uh, but yes, at the end of the panel, I remember saying uh, you should go up to the first second booth, get these guys' books signed. You should go buy everything at the first second book uh, booth because it's like the Pixar of comics. And I said. And look, everything Pixar's done is great. Yeah, they did Cars, but Cars was pretty good too. So, <laughs> and then there's all these little boys in the in the in the audience who are like, "I really like Cars." <laughs> <laughs> and when it, and you're not going to tell another uh, like out of out of school story. When 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 I early on when I met uh, when I started becoming friendly with Dave Roman, mm-hmm. uh, I remember I was having dinner with him at a con. I forget which one. And it was just before Astronaut Academy came out. It was like it was like eh, months and months and months before that came out. And I remember uh, I was saying something effective like, "Wow, awesome for you! You for a second Pixar comics." And he's like, "Yeah, well, you know, I'm really nervous because I don't know how this is going to be received." And I'm like, "Well, you could just be the cars of of, uh, of first second comics, uh, which is still pretty good." And I remember I, I think it was too soon. I don't think we were that good of friends yet that I could say uh-huh. that because like the, the table just went quiet. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I was like I didn't mean it that way. I was trying to just like bring levity to the thing. Anyway. All right. So you are published by First Second Comics and Dark Horse yes. Comics. You do a lot of good stuff. And you now teach comics classes. Congratulations to you. Where are you teaching? You. Um, I teach at UMass Dartmouth, which is actually my alma mater. And uh, I'm in their um, I'm in their illustration department. Um, so it's not specifically comics, but it's illustration, which you know, uh, visual language, visual storytelling. It's all the same. You know, yeah, it's all the same beast. And uh, it's great because I'm actually teaching now alongside with the guys that taught me. You know, after however many X Y Z years I've been out, they're still there, and. Uh, so now I get to be kind of like a colleague, which is a little surreal, but it's a lot of fun. So yeah, I well, I bet it's also a lot of work. Uh, yeah, it is at the college level. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. You, you teach sophomores, right? Yeah, it's a sophomore sophomore illustrators. Yep. All right. Question. Um, yes. This is this is just like kind of like uh, uh, it's on the squishier side, but when you're putting together your syllabus for this. Are you finding that you are discovering new things about what's important to you as a cartoonist in the selections that you make? Like, because the, the, like, what you're really doing in, in, when you're teaching is you're reverse engineering what it is that you do when you're drawing, right? You're like, okay, what am I doing, and how do I communicate that back to young people? So, are has have there been any revelations for you as an artist that, like, oh, th- I guess this this was really important to me after all, and I didn't even realize I was doing that. Well, I mean, I think one of the things that I found is, you know, sometimes you learn something and then you use it and then you it it becomes so instinctual for you that you you forget the mechanics of it, you know. And so you have to kind of stop yourself when when a student says, well, you know, how do you do like this this hatching? You know, they're using pen and ink. Because you can't go, well, you just do this. You know, you can't do that. 
Right. That's not that's not really effective teaching. And so it's been very interesting for me to kind of step back and, you know, like you you said, reverse engineer, like really go back and think, OK, what am I actually doing? And what's been great is it's been a great refresher for me, too. You know, it's been great to go back and be like, all right, this is how you do certain things with watercolor. This is how you handle, you know, and even materials that I have not used since I was in school, like vine charcoal, things like that. You know, it's nice to get back and kind of flex those muscles again. Uh, have, have you, how, how has this affected the way that you're doing your work now or has it at all? I mean, cause I'll, I'll tell you for me, there's sometimes where I learn from my students and there are times where unboxing and, and reverse engineering my stuff like unlocks new things for me. But then other times it can like really lock me up because I'll, in systematizing what I do sometimes, I'll just I'll hear myself saying like, well, what do you tell your students? Just do this, this, and this, and then I'll just get stuck in the the, the mechanical part of it instead of remembering that sometimes you just kind of have to get into flow state. Does that make right. sense? So how well, does... I mean, I think I mean sort of to that end. I mean, and, and this is one of the things that I've been trying to tell them. And keep in mind, I haven't been at it this long. I mean, just since September. Um, so, but one of the things that I do tell them is you know, it's all about the end result. Like if I, if I show you how to do something or if I t give you guidelines on how to do something, but you can get a better result doing it another way, then do it. You know, like I don't, I don't care. Like what is important is the final result and that there's not, you know, I, I try to kind of say, look, this is a way of doing this. This is a way that works for me. This is a way that works maybe even for most people. But it doesn't have to work for all people. Wow. See, you're a pretty opinionated guy. And I'm surprised. Says you. <laughs> I, w I was expecting to hear a little bit of, you want to do it the right way? Or do you want to do it the wrong way? And the right way is the Zach way. Uh, no. You're not that kind of teacher, no. though. No? I'm, I'm a little wounded, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trolling you again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but no, I mean because like we've we've all had that teacher, right? We've all had the like this is the way that it must be done. But so you're not it's not like algebra class with you. It's like you don't need to show the work, just show the the, the results. Yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. And you know, building on that, I mean, did you ever have a math teacher or a science teacher in high school where they would explain something? They would say, "Well, it's da 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 da," and you say, "Well, I don't get it." And they say, well, it's da 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 da. Well, I don't really understand. Well, it's da da, you know, like yeah. that. You know, they're teaching one way because that's what they know and that's what they're comfortable with. And I think for a lot of people, like that's sort of the, the safety net, that's the security blanket. Well, this is the way that works for me. So it should work for you too. Well, this is where we can get to maybe some of the, t this is why I wanted to use this topic with you, Zach, is because I know with your background in teaching, with all of the thoughtful things that you've posted about the lifestyle of, of an artist, is mm -hmm. I wanted to come back to this old, old idea of talent versus effort. And I know, you know, I'll, I'll telegraph my punches here a little bit with, um, you know, I sometimes I get a little itchy when somebody's like, Oh, you're so talented. It must be wonderful to uh, to be able to employ this talent in such a fun career. And I'm like, "Wow, you just like made light of 20 years of yeah. really sweating things and working really hard." Um but then I think about well, I'm going to frame up the the, the the next talking point discussion point this talent versus effort thing. So I know you got opinions on this, Zach. I do. Uh, this is where I'm opinionated. <laughs> <laughs> And it's 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 so much fun to watch you talk about this or read about the, your your <laughs> thoughts on this. Um, people should follow your uh, follow you on Tumblr and on the suitably authenticated Zach Yolango page to hear his thoughts on this. Have you found my Twitter to be more positive? I know you said it was, it was a couple of years ago. You felt that it was negative. I didn't say negative. Though I think the word I used was acerbic, which is different than negative. Okay, acerbic is is a biting wit right a okay. little bit of a you know like you got a wit with a bite to it but i wouldn't say that you are insincere or or bitter about your okay. stuff and that's that's why i think this is such an interesting topic when we talk about this idea of talent versus effort because the the when we start talking about the effort of doing a thing and the, the years of effort going to it 
boy, oh boy, A, it's not a sexy topic, right? Hey, guess what? Uh, wait, wait uh, dear, dear Mr. Jones, I want to be a cartoonist. Well, you're going to have to work your butt off for 30 years before you even get anywhere near to where you think it's any good. Oh, gee, you know, that's not yeah. that's not a very compelling idea. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and there's there's a lot of. A lot of opportunities to come off as bitter when you start talking about how hard it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that I've had people, uh, you know, come at me uh, in the past saying like, geez, Jers, you sure whine a lot about how hard this stuff is. And I'm like, really? Do I come off as whining? You know, I don't think I do. But but, but then, you know, it's like we live in this. I'm, I'm going to back up to like build my initial point here. It's like I think of something Tony Cliff said. Uh, a while back, and I want to paraphrase because Twitter, you suck at keeping an archive of your tweets because I can't just go search for it like something from like eight months to a year ago. Uh, Tony Cliff, uh, Tango Charlie, DelilahDirk.com, another first second book, really good. He he said something Love to the effect it. of how we're in this really terrific time of comics where uh, classical drawing skills are not a requirement to create something that is visually appealing. And mm-hmm. I thought that was a really nice, succinct way of, de- of describing how, like, yeah, the, the doors have been open. Anybody can do this thing now. Yes, anybody can do this thing, but you know we get like with this 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 effusiveness about this wonderful time where ev- the doors are open and the the mediators are gone, the gatekeepers are gone means that we get these Zen pencils, uh, you know, cartoons. Oh, and I think of that cartoon you posted on your Tumblr, uh, Matt. Do we have that cartoon, the one with the, duck? the one I did or one I just reposted? You reposted the one with the how to be an artist with the duck. Oh, with Dad, the duck. Dance barefoot, believe in magic, be free. How to be a good artist. Work longer, harder, and be more dedicated than those magical barefoot posers. And the duck's like, hey. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we get these. And things. I wish I could remember. I can't remember off the top of my head who did that oh, we'll, cartoon. We'll link to it in the show notes. But, yeah. And, it, and when we pulled it up on screen, actually, the credit was on the, 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 yeah. the cartoon. But, um, but yeah, it'll be linked in the show notes at comicsregate.com slash CAG106. But... So you get these Zen pencils car- cartoons like like believe in yourself and you can make awesome things like follow your bliss and all that stuff. Yeah, that gets you started. That gets you started. But mm-hmm. it's bypassing or ignoring the years of toil that it will take, even if you're not classically trained, in order to hone an idea, to craft something, to find your voice, to shape your voice into something that is unique and completely you and like original, not in the sense of nobody's seen it before, but original and is like purely your vision. That takes years of sweating it. So the question, the big question, is how do we make that toil into an attractive thing instead of the, the rantings of a bitter old fool who had a hard time at this thing? Because I tell you, as a 17-year-old, when I heard people talk like that, I'm like, yeah, well, it's hard for you, but it ain't going to be that way for me because the world's never seen me before. I'm you know, very special. You know? uh, and how do we address this topic in a way that's useful and not combative, Right. Yeah, I mean, because unfortunately, I think part of the problem, part of the trouble with that is kind of a, a, a biological, psychological one, which is, you know, you can tell a 17 year old something and they may not listen to it versus if you tell, you know, a 27 year old, they might be, you know, maybe a little more receptive, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, one of the things that I've tried to do, and actually, I did this just the other day um, with one of my students who's really into animation, wanting to be an animator. And I started bringing up, um, you know, the old Disney animators and the old Disney films and the nine old men and all that. And I said, you know, when you go and you do a little bit of research and you look at their non-Disney work, they're all fine artists. I mean, these are guys that can paint. These are guys that can draw. You know, they, they didn't they didn't come in drawing in a Disney style. They had a skill and they had, you know, they, they had their foundations, they knew their basics. And then that still, that style was arrived at. And I think that's one of the things too, is kind of trying to get people to understand that when you're, when you're kind of drawing, just as an example, when you're drawing like in a Disney style, kind of straight off the bat, you know, you're kind of doing a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. And it's kind of like generations of VHS tape, you know, just to make just to make my metaphor even more obscure, for you know, <laughs> younger people. Are you going to refer to UAF, UHF stations next? <laughs> right. So, <laughs> um, but as far as like making it attractive, I think what's helpful is if they can see something that they already like 
And if you can kind of trace it back and see like, look, that's what this guy did, you know, or even, um, you know, even if you look at, okay, I'll take an example, Calvin and Hobbes. Look at the first strip of Calvin and Hobbes. You know, those characters do not look like, I mean, yeah, they kind of do, but there's an evolution there. And so I think instead of just saying you got to work hard and you got to do this and you got to toil, I think if you can actually show examples and examples that they care about, Mm. you know, examples that they are already connected with and Mm. then be able to kind of trace that back and like, see, that's what this guy did. And that's what this artist did. And, and. So things you, like that. You actually take time to actually get to know what your students' backgrounds and interests are. Uh, some of them. I mean, some look. Some of them have them, and some of them don't. I mean, that's you know, that's the thing too. Is there there are some students who you know whether they've told you or not. Sometimes you have to ask them. Yeah. But they have like they have a fire. They have something that they really want to do, and they they have a plan ahead of them. And then there are others that don't. Well, you know? I mean, the, 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 the privilege of, of teaching illustration classes and comics classes is that people show up to these things really wanting to do it. You know, this is by no means like, uh, you know, uh, core curriculum material, right? Although in my experience when I was teaching high school classes, I did get my occasional kid who took it as a blow off, right? It was like, oh, this will be easy. Uh, comics, blah, whatever, you know, <laughs> and that that's the only time when, I, when the kid gets the stink eye from me. But uh, <laughs> but I wonder if we could like, maybe press on this this topic a little bit by going at um, – <clears throat> I collected some assumptions that I get from young students, mm-hmm. and I, I'm wondering if you've heard some of these before. And and maybe in answering these, we can sort of shape this way of talking about this this topic. Because like I'll, I'll get the student who says, uh, "Well, mom and dad said I got a talent, got a natural talent. I don't need to draw every day. I don't need to fill a sketchbook. You know, this is this is grinding. You're pushing grinding at me, and I don't like to do that. I just got a gift." And when it's there, I use it, but I don't need the the, the pressure of a daily deadline uh, to to make me good at this thing. Because I just kind of am, right? It's a natural thing. It's in my spirit. It's in my soul. Don't take that away from me, Zach. Well, I mean, some of that, I think, is also dependent on age. If a high schooler were to say that to me, you know, I probably wouldn't press as hard as if a college student said that to me, I would say, then this isn't for you. <laughs> as simple as that. No, I mean, <laughs> I, I actually, you know, I actually heard this, this, like, I heard this from a college sophomore when I was in college. I remember he looked at me yeah. and I was, I was working for an Arctic press at the time and I was doing a deadline and I was sweating it. And he's like, he's like, wow, you have to draw every day, don't you? And I was like, well, yeah. And he, he said like, I don't have to, I just, it just comes naturally, you know? And like, I just, when I feel the feeling, I just do it. And I remember just, uh, at the time, I was exceedingly angry at that guy. Uh, now I realize, okay, he just can be kind of young, and maybe he, he didn't want to be a serious artist. But anyway, continue. You should say if it's not you're, for... Okay, if you're an illustrator, and I'll use the term illustrator very broadly. So if you're illustrating comics, if you're illustrating children's books, if you're you know doing editorial illustration, any of that, it's a job. It's a job. You wouldn't work at Subway and go... You know, if you work at Subway... And you say, well, I just go in when I feel like it. Well, guess what? Guess how long that's going to last. <laughs> but because art and creative things have this mystical aura around them, people, f- they, 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 they gloss over that. They gloss over that this is a job. This is something you do to make money so that you can live. Now, I'm not saying, oh, you, you know, I'm not trying to say like, oh, you're just in it for the money, but it's. But that is the difference between do you want this to be a career or is this a hobby? Because and and believe me, I do not use that word hobby as a in a in a pejorative way. If you are someone who just wants to do things for yourself and when the mood strikes you, then, you know, nothing should stop you. There's nothing wrong with that. There are plenty of people who do that. But if you want to be a comic book artist, that's going to be a tough attitude to have when you have to produce, you know, however many hundreds of drawings every month. But I'm a perfectionist, Zach. It takes a long time. I'm, I like my work to be perfect and, you know, we can't always, you know, you want it good or do you want it fast? I'm a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. 
okay, well, get over it. Um, <laughs> you know, being a perfectionist, again, it's one of these things. You have, you have real-world constraints, which is if you're working on a comic page – for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, how are you going to get anything else done? You can't. You got to know when to cut bait. Um, I'm a firm believer in the, the the phrase about you know, no artwork is finished; it's only abandoned. Yeah. Because you can always keep going. You can always keep tweaking. You can always keep making things perfect. Um, and I think I sort of take issue with this idea of perfect. What is perfect? You know, like I've seen students who will say, um, well, I'm waiting until I get my portfolio really up to a high level before I show people. And I say, well, when will that be? They say, well, I don't know. Because what happens is when you have that attitude, you end up just going in perpetuity. And you have to understand as an artist, all artists, none of us are happy. You know, like none of us, I don't mean none of us are happy. (laughs) none None of us are happy with our work all the time and that's called improving and that's called evolving you know like you know that this drawing is what it is and the next one's going to be a little bit better and the next one's going to be a little bit better and so on and so on and so on it's 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 a journey it's not a destination to sound like you know a yearbook quote or whatever or or a zen pencils right uh all right um you know, you got me doing, I'm doing scratch board today. I'm doing watercolors tomorrow. Look, Mr. Giolongo, I just need to learn how to draw superheroes or draw manga style so I can get a job and do that. Uh, I don't need this other stuff. And you kind of address that by talking about some examples of, of like famous people. But um, do you run into that in your classes at all? Or are you getting pretty signed on kids? Um, I mean... I haven't run into it too much only because, um, like I said, you know, I haven't been doing it that long. Yeah. And I think that they are, are also still kind of in that mode of knowing that they've got to kind of learn all these things. But I've run into like colleagues and peers who feel that way. Wow. I feel like scratch board, watercolor, but I just would need to do superheroes or whatever. This is the same thing as you would tell a writer, if a writer wants to do science fiction, but only reads science fiction books themselves, their work's going to be a little lacking or, you know, derivative, that kind of thing. I feel like, you know, you don't have to be a master watercolor painter. You don't have to be a master scratch boardist. Um, but the more arrows you have in your quiver, you know, everything, everything feeds into everything else. Everything is interconnected and everything, um, you know, these things are not as compartmentalized as you think that they are. Um, you can oftentimes look at somebody who has only looked at superhero comics or who has only looked at manga. You can tell, you know, and I also just... You know, part of me is also like, it's a big, beautiful world out there, you know, like try different things. And that doesn't mean that you have to abandon what you really love, but it will enrich whatever you, whatever you want your focus to be. One of the things that uh, my students, my high school students will boo me about when I start talking about is I'll, I'll start talking about how, you know, physics, geometry, psychology, uh, uh, humanities, all these things feed into making comics. And they go, what? No, it's about drawing fantasy worlds. It's not about, I'm like, well, and and like, I've had a hard time explaining to them that like, you know, experiencing things (laughs) and reading a lot of things adds to your tool chest. You can have access to more characters. And I, and I always tell the story of, um, Sam and Jim go to Hollywood. It's an old podcast that I used to listen to back like 10 years ago. And it was two Hollywood screenwriters who, before going to Hollywood, opened up a restaurant. And why did they open up a restaurant? Because they said, now we've got like this roach motel for characters. We're going to get a lot of different kinds of people coming in here. We're going to meet so many different kinds of people. We're going to collect all these characters. And then when we go to Hollywood, we will have those characters in our tool chest for, Mm -hmm. you know, writing stories. Uh, Again, that's... It's really abstract to somebody who doesn't have that experience yet, you know? So, uh, it's like, it's like being a method actor, right? 
You yeah. know, it's like one of these actors who knows that, okay, they're shooting a scene tomorrow where their character has been, you know, stressed out and up all night. So what do they do? Yeah. They'll actually stay up all night the day before the shoot so that they come in and they're like, yeah. you know, they're haggard, they're, they're little, you know, they're, they're stretched thin, that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, you know, like I, that's, that's how I feel. That's how I feel sometimes about it. All right. What about this one? Have you gotten run across this one yet? Because you're preparing kids to actually go into the real world, whereas I'm preparing them to go off to college. Right. Um, I'm just going to do some great work on the Internet, and the work's going to come to me on my terms. People are just going to find me. They're going to say, this kid is something unique that the world has never seen before, and I need it in my life, and here's some money. Right? Um, how, 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 do you, how would you respond to that as, as Professor... Yolanda. One of the wonderful things about the internet <laughs> is that anyone can do comics. And one of the terrible things about the internet is anyone can do comics. <laughs> uh, look, do people get discovered? Sure. Happened to you. I'm going to do did. what you did. I'm going to do what you it, did. I'm going to post things on Tumblr and that's just money, right? That's what happened. Uh, well, <laughs> see, this is the thing that, that I, I'm always sort of careful. So, okay, so I will reference what you're talking about. You're talking about the Ewoks again, right? Yeah. Okay, so I had done, just a little background, I had done a drawing of some Ewoks that I had posted on Tumblr, and I said, oh, I'd love to do, you know, an Ewok comic, you know, Dark Horse, let me know, you know, that kind of thing. And it got, you know reblogged and retumbled or whatever and sure enough an editor from dark horse saw it and contacted me but here's the thing they didn't come to me and go this is great here's a contract here's a pile of money <laughs> they came to me and said hey saw this drawing you did interested into it interested in it um do you have comics experience do you have work and I got to turn around and say, why, yes, I do. And I showed them this whole book that I had done. And they said, okay, great. And then we started talking. So in terms of, like, I wouldn't say I was discovered that way, but I would say that it did start a dialogue for me that I then had to back up. You know, I had to back it up with the work that I've done. Um, you know, and I had done previous work. So that, that helped, you know, they wanted to see that I could do a comic. They wanted to see that I could finish a comic. Um, you know, I think that that's really the exception to the rule, especially when you hear about people who are truly discovered online, you know, they're just out there toiling away, toiling away. Um, and then they end up, you know, sort of hitting it big. Um, and I'm trying to think, because, you know, we're still relatively new to the Internet thing. And I'm trying to think of and – and I'm – this is like legit. I'm not setting anything up. But can you think of some people who have, you know, sort of like were just posting things on the Internet and then sort of got picked up and became a huge kind of sensation? Uh. I suppose – what you mean, like, like well, I mean, in most of the examples, Noel I can... Stevenson comes to mind. Noel Stevenson, yeah. Um, Ginger Hayes on Tumblr. Uh, mm -hmm, most people mm -hmm. are familiar with her if you use Tumblr at all. Uh, no, I, I mean, I, I think of like the guys like Ryan North with Dinosaur Comics and all the subsequent things he's done since then. But he's running his own business, and but he works with publishers right. too. But there's also like that's that's also bypassing the long grind he had to build up to that. Like all these things when like whenever we talk, and this is this is part of the problem is that um this it's a compelling story to talk about the overnight success. Like for instance, every movie about somebody leveling up and having to do some kind of difficult thing the difficult grinding part is always a music montage right mm -hmm. yeah when when the, when the a team is building their super vehicle in the garage it's always mm -hmm. a music montage it's not three and a half hours of oh gosh i broke another bolt 
got to go to the hardware right. store. You know, uh, why isn't this fitting right? You know, they, they bypass it because it's not interesting to people. What's interesting is I worked really hard for a couple months, and then bam, I'm awesome at this thing. The overnight success kind of thing is, is a really compelling story. And unfortunately, you know, when you're young, you don't have the, the, the or beginning for that matter. Like if you're just starting, like even if you're 40 and you're like, I'm going to draw comics now and I've never done it before. You don't have the perspective of uh, interacting with that medium to know that all that grinding is not going to be a music montage, right? There is something, this, this is a little bit of a tangent, Please. but I think it's, but I think it's, it still feeds in. So there's this thing that I love and it's called the, I believe it's the Dunning Kruger effect. Do you mm. know about this? I, I don't know. So it's not, it's not like a full disorder, but it is this thing where, um, and you know, these people, I know these people, we all have experience with these people where someone really overestimates their uh, skill in a particular thing due to the fact that they are very ignorant in it. Okay. Does that, I don't know if I'm articulating that right, but in other words, someone thinks that they are really good at something and it is all, it is kind of a cognitive disorder. Like look at like my amazing comic. Like you'll see these people at shows who talk about their amazing comic stuff that no one's ever seen before and you know they're going to be the next whatever yeah and then you look at it and you're like are you kidding me (laughs) and it's because like they themselves are are ignorant and i'm using ignorant in you know lowercase i you know they just don't have the experience right right. um they just they don't have the experience they don't have maybe the literacy in that particular realm to know that what they're doing is bad (laughs) so okay let's let's underline something here so you're not saying that young people or people just starting out are dumb no of course not okay because well i mean this is i think it's important Did i sound like i was saying that heck no no i i'm 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 I'm, uh emphasizing it because i do think that this is a, a perilous road when we talk about this and some people do default to kids are stupid you know okay if you go to a gym, you don't go over to the weights and start lifting 250 pound weights. Right. You know, you go in and you lift like the 10 pound weights. And when you you're lifting the 10 pound weights, only a jerk would look over at you and go only 10 pound weights, huh? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. That's what we call a bully. Uh, mm-hmm. So, you know, yeah, this is something, this is the reason I get like kind of fired up about this topic is like, it, this is a kind of intellectual bullying is to be, uh, dismissive of people who are ignorant of something or just starting out or because they're young and say like, oh, well, you know, no, there's no better way to plant a flag that says I'm old and bitter than to say you dumb kids. Uh, and you know what? In general, I, I mean, I know I'm acerbic and opinionated and all those words that you used for me, but <laughs> but I actually I, I really bristle and I see it on the internet, whether it's about um, political issues or, or social issues or whatever, things like that. I really bristle when somebody asks a legitimate question that is coming from a place of ignorance. And again, I'm using that in a lowercase i ignorance. They just haven't been told. And everybody jumps in on them about, you know, like, I can't believe you don't know this. Like, how, oh, this question again, like this yeah. kind of thing. It's like, guess what? Not everybody knows. Yeah. And you're not doing anybody any favors by making them, by, by attacking them for asking a question. Because you know what? They could have not asked it at all. Right. They could have, best you know, case they scenario. avoided the topic altogether and remained ignorant. Yeah. Best yeah, case scenario, best. you've prevented them from asking again because they don't want to get that reaction. Exactly. And yeah, maybe in the back of your head, you're eye rolling and you're kind of huffing, but you have to, you know, I I really do feel like you have to kind of, kind of bite the bullet and just, you know, you just kind of go, okay, yeah, this is what it is. And this is why, you know, not everybody's afforded all the same opportunities, you know? So So, question, question. Uh, Mm -hmm. how do we make effort and honored behavior because i'll tell you i mean i i remember after hearing uh it, it might have been this american life story or something a couple years back i remember hearing a story about how the difference between eastern teaching uh pedagogy and western is that in the west we tend to generally speaking honor smarts oh that was very smart you're very smart by doing that that was a smart thing to do but in the east uh in in some asian countries they would say uh you worked very hard today 
That was that was you worked very very hard and you solved the problem through your efforts. Oh, I see. Okay. You see what I'm saying? And and since yeah. then I've adopted in my classroom and with my production assistant Rachel, like when she leaves every every day she leaves, I'll say like thank you for all your hard work today and I say to my students, now I I don't congratulate them on being brilliant creative people. I say Boy, you guys really attacked this thing, and you gave it your all, and thanks for all your hard work. But, I mean, that's a subtle thing, and that's something that I don't think they're going to pick up on necessarily. But, like, it's something that I've been crunching on for a long time as a teaching artist is, like, and, and as somebody who just interacts with people online, like, how can we make the effort an attractive thing? How can we make working hard into something like, and not to turn us into the Pennsylvania Dutch, but something, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, but something where it's like, it's cool to really bust your butt at something. Yeah. Uh, instead of like, oh, you've got talent. You've got talent. It's just, it's something that just, I mean, this is the part that I find so incongruous about it, is that if you tell me that it's in my DNA, then I got nothing to do with it. If it's just something where I'm just predisposed to be good at it, then I don't get to take credit for it. But if you tell me that it's my effort, then I get to take credit for it. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, I, I, I think that's it. I think that it, it's, it's coming from it at that angle, you know, and not talking about, you know, talent or, oh, you're really smart or, oh, you know, you're really good at, you know, because yeah, because that implies that there's some kind of magical thing that has, has touched you and you just sort of, you know, independent of any brain or anything like that, you're just able to do it and that you're not really in, con you're almost not even in control of it. It just is this thing that you have. Um, and the reverse of that is that then people go, well, I'll never be able to do that. Yes! I don't have that. I don't have that magic. I don't have that magic gem in my chest that allows me to do that. Uh, uh, permit me to raspberry at that. I, I, yeah, that's one of the ones where I roll my eyes. Uh, yeah. Well, inwardly, I roll my eyes, and then everybody gets their one free pep talk from me of like, no, anybody could do this kind of thing if you, if you yeah. work really hard and if you think really hard and if you keep your analytic eye open all the time and pay attention to what's happening around you and internalize it and whenever something moves you emotionally, ask yourself why. Um, but yeah, but you're right. I mean, it, it turns it into like I, I can think of fewer things as unattractive as me being some kind of vessel for some outward force acting through me. Uh, right. I want to put my name on the bottom of that drawing, and I want my name to say, look at what I did, everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> for better or worse, I want the credit. Well, and, you know, and it's the kind of thing where, you know, in schools it's like when you have these kids who are, are told either overtly or, or subtly that they're not smart and they end up in, you know, lower level classes. And what happens is they believe it and then they themselves stop trying because it's like, well, I'm not. OK, I uh, two years ago, I went down to Miami for the Miami Book Festival. That's a great. Festival. And I had to visit schools. And I had this very nice woman who was, you know, taking me around because I don't know Miami. And she started explaining to me, she said, so I want you to know that Miami schools are graded. So Miami schools, it'll be like, okay, this school is an A school. This school is a B school. This school, you know, so on and so on. So she told me this as we were leaving one school and going to the other. And she said, the school that you just left is an A school. And I said, okay. And she said, and I want you to know that the school that we're going to is a C school. And that means it can, you know, maybe be a little bit rougher. And I said, okay. And she said, one of the problems that they're trying to change and that she was trying to change and other people, you know, legislatively is to get rid of that. Because when you have a bunch of people in a C school, rather than saying, we're going to become an A school or we're going to become a B school and then we're going to become an A school, they go, eh, we're a C school. What do you want? Yeah. You know, like this is, oh, your students didn't do as well here. Yeah, well, we're a C school. Yes, the fatalism of, well, that's what we are. That's what I am, after yeah. all. You know, and that's another thing about pointing to the talent uh, argument is that it, it suggests a fatalism, that you can't change what you are. Your DNA is just such that you are stuck with what you got, kid. And, and in certain respects, that's true. 
but when it comes to uh, using your mind and being creative, and there's there's always some place you can go with it. Uh, that at least th- that that's my boundless optimism on the subject that tends to infuriate some people. <laughs> but don't but, you think part of it too is a lot of this current pop culture things like American Idol and things like that, where it's like, oh, if you want to be a singer, what you have to do is you got to get on a contest and get up there and belt your heart out and the next thing you know you've you signed however many record deals and and that kind of thing and and it's so you know dangerously misleading that that's how life works that you you have this gift and you just someone just needs to see it once and then you're you know because you're off you only get one uh one chance zach one chance if you blow it they will never ask you back you will never ago yeah please they, um, I read this article, I think it might've been in, well, I don't remember where it was, but it was about Abraham Lincoln and Charles Darwin. And they were both, I believe they were both born in the same year. And it was talking about, uh, their similarities as people. And one of the things that I took away that I was like, huh, is neither one of them really did anything significant until they were in their fifties. Wow. And you think about these two juggernauts in our history, you know, but it's like they didn't come out of the gate as these, you know, young prodigies. Mm -hmm. They were in their 50s. I mean, they were middle aged before either one of them did anything noteworthy at all. And I took comfort in that, (laughs) you know, like it's like, yeah, you know, it's not this like you said. You just have to have your one shot, and it's got to be when you're 21. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the other thing too. It's got there's a schedule to this thing, Zach. You, right. You, yeah. You, Twenty by 27, uh, you kind of you hit your peak, and they send you off to the creative spinster home. <laughs> well, they, well, Malachi puts you up on that cross, and then the monster comes to get you. After all, because you know <laughs> it, you're no good after 30 for crying yeah. out loud. But no, I think about the same thing. Like Jack Kirby did the Fantastic Four number one when he was like 41 years old. Uh, mm-hmm. L. Frank Baum wrote The Wizard of Oz when he was in his 40s after being a milkman and a sales uh, salesperson and all these other yeah. other jobs. You know. Uh, but that again, that's a difficult thing to communicate to young people because they don't have that that contextual experience yet. But uh, but yeah, this is another thing that we a story we like to tell ourselves. And gosh, I I, I don't I haven't pinned down where this comes from because I'm not a sociologist, and that's just who I am, Zach. I'm just I'm a cartoonist. I can't do anything except cartooning. But uh, is you that Jersey all of a sudden? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. That was that was my I'm not thinking about it anymore. Voice. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, is, I don't know where it comes from, but it's a story we like to tell ourselves about this this life having a schedule thing. Yeah, and uh, and this whole idea of I missed my shot, uh, which mm. I, I find absolutely perplexing. Uh, I I don't know how I missed out on that anxiety, um, but I mean, yes, you can you can really stumble and you can really screw up a career, right? You can like let people down and have a bad reputation. You could have a meltdown on Facebook about you know gender issues or something when you really should keep your mouth shut if you feel that way. Uh, yeah. But uh, you know, but you get other chances if you don't make any kind of horrendous mistake, right? Well, I wonder if and, and same thing. I'm I'm also you know. Not a sociologist, I'm just a cartoonist. <laughs> um, if I had to make an educated guess. Um, but, you know, I kind of wonder if a lot of that comes from, you know, American <laughs> culture, American society, where, you know, we have this reputation of being, you know, oh, you know, the lazy American, and yet we are a working culture. We're a working society. And there's this idea of, you know, kind of following a certain path career wise, you know, going to school, getting out of school, getting a job, you know, moving up through the ranks, that kind of thing. So I wonder, it's got to be tied to that somehow. Did I really make that voice? I'm sorry if I made that voice. (laughs) (laughs) That's that's how relaxed I feel around you, Zach. (laughs) Well, you know, another thing that I would throw on the table, and I I wonder if you've tried, do you, when you show, do you show your work to your students? Like when, you Mm -hmm. know, okay. Yeah. Do you show them yeah, only the best I, stuff or do you show them all the warts and everything? I have sort of like a general go-to presentation that I'll do when I'm giving talks. And one of the first images I show is one that I drew when I was in the first grade. Um, and awesome. I kind of just, yeah, yeah, I go through that because I kind of want to show like this is what my drawings looked like in high school. This is what my drawings looked like 
when I was in college. This is what they look like when I was out of college. I don't show them just sort of like, you know, the highlights. Um, You know, I want to show them everything so they can see an evolution. They can see where it comes from. Um, That's great. Yeah, but I, I definitely, I definitely do show my students um, also partially because I want them to feel like at least to an extent, I know what I'm talking about. It's kind of like, you know, I kind of want to put my money where my mouth is. So I feel like that's an element of it too. Cause I had teachers, I had teachers when I was in school who wouldn't show their work. And then you start saying, well, why is that? You know, why don't you want me to see your paintings? Yeah. So, yeah, well, yeah, are they a sophist, right? Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I, I had an experience recently, and this is all thanks to Ruth McNally Barshaw of the Ellie McDoodle book series, who is just like, one of the most wonderful, generous people in the entire world, uh, on top of being a, ter- a terrific cartoonist and storyteller. But I had a, a, a little girl in one of my youth classes who was, she was coming every week, but she was not drawing anything. She was not, she would not put pencil to paper, but she would still show up to class every week. I'm like, well, she wants to be here, I think. Otherwise, either that or mom and dad are like, we're paying for this class. You better take yeah. it. But um, she doesn't seem unhappy. She just seems like she doesn't want me to see anything that she draws. And so I'm like, I'm like, well, does she hate drawing? Or is she being forced to be here? And, and Ruth, I, I posted this to a private Facebook uh, group, and I was like, I, I, guys, I'm really struggling with this because like, when this happens, like my salesman face just goes into overdrive. I'm like, I got to win this kid. Nobody yeah, walks. I, I, I remember this. I remember yeah. this. Yeah. And, and uh, nobody walks out of my class not loving comics. You know, mm-hmm. not on my watch. Uh, what do it, I have to do to get you into a new comic? Oh, I'm t- I'm totally that guy. Yeah, yeah. I, I really <laughs> want them to love it the way I love it, or at least feign it. <laughs> but, so Ruth said, like maybe she's paralyzed by praise. It could be that she's told that she's so good that mm-hmm. she's afraid that if she you know, performs in front of you, a professional that you may, you know, cut her down because you're the one with like the credibility, whereas mom and dad are just telling her like, she's great. And you know, there's all that mixed messaging in there. Uh, and so I was like, okay, well, so I, I came to class with a comic I drew in fifth grade and I started showing them the pages and like the kids are like, well, it's not that bad. And I'm like, yeah, well you compare it to now it's pretty bad. And then I, I, I trumped up this story about how I was really afraid to show it to people because I was afraid people would laugh at me or they'd say that it was no good. And then I showed it to a friend who uh, really liked the ideas and gave me this really great insight on how to draw hands that dr- drastically affected my career and made me a lot better as a cartoonist and all these wonderful things that are happening as a result of that one little piece of insight that I got because a friend looked at, oh, and I, and I also trumped up the story saying that my friend looked at it without my permission. So like, mm-hmm. you know, it was like I was hiding it. He, he, right. he got into it. But then because of that chance thing, this wonderful thing happened. So I trumped up this little story. That day, the girl started drawing in the class. So Ruth was yeah. right. And oh my gosh, it was just like, like you know, the, that's when the angels started singing for me. But uh, I wonder if that's part of it, is that we as teaching artists and as people on the internet who share our experiences need to do a little storytelling about the struggles in a way that has some kind of um, moral of the story, I guess. I don't know. Does that even, am I saying things with that? But yeah, well, immediately where my mind went is, you know, I think like a lot of people of my generation, of our generation, of our of our station really looked up to Jim Henson. And he was certainly a hero of mine. I mean, absolutely. And I just got finished uh, reading the, the recent biography that came out. And, you know, people say, well, you shouldn't know too much about your heroes but I loved it. I loved reading every flaw, every misstep, every um, every down note that he had. And not from like a <laughs> kind of thing, yeah. but it's like, man, see, he's he's just a guy. He's just a guy, just like just like me, just like you. And I think that's the thing is sometimes like, you know, we lionize these, these heroes or these people who are at different stations and they become these, these godlike figures where again, here it is, they've got an ability, you know, they've been, you know, they've been touched by Zeus and they have a skill and an ability that us mere mortals could never have. And then that can feel very discouraging. But when you see that's that, that is not the case, I find it encouraging. 
you're reminding me of a terrible girlfriend I had when I was young, and I was doing. Wait, 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 wait. What? <laughs> no, not you personally. You have a terrible girlfriend. You had not what yeah. you not what not you personally, but what you're talking okay. about. Because uh, I remember uh, early on when I was first trying to do this comics thing, and I was dating this girl, and I remember saying like I was I was talking about Jim Henson's life because uh, like you, he was a hero to me as a child. As a matter of fact, in second grade, I thought I wanted to be a puppeteer before I wanted to be a cartoonist, and I used to put on me puppet too. shows. Yeah, I put on puppet shows every Friday for my second grade class, uh, mm-hmm. like a lot of a lot of us guys, right? Um, and I remember saying something like, well, you know, I try to think about what would Jim Henson do in this situation. And I remember she said to me, she said, well, you're not Jim Henson. And I was like, oh, that makes me feel really crappy. <laughs> yeah. Oof. Like, you only That's get a Jim supportive. Henson once a century. And you, sir, are no Jim Henson. Okay, well, you know what? I knew that. Right. Uh, I was just trying to use the guy as a model for thinking about how to make a decision on this thing, and instead you turn it into this value judgment about me as a person and predestining me to not be any good. You know, it's like right. that's the right. kind of thinking that happens when you lionize these kinds of people, right? Right. Right. Uh, yeah, man. Okay. Well, but I think what's tough too is then when people say things like that and they don't, you know, they're they're not saying it to be cruel. They're saying it from a place of indifference, which I think is even worse, you know? No, I mean, it, it, you know, it's different when someone says something because they want to hurt you, but when someone says something kind of off the cuff because they don't, you know, and then that, like, that's even worse sometimes. Uh, like, like, welcome to New York. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I had to do the voice again. Uh, that was from Friday, th- Friday 13th, part eight. Um, oh. Okay, well, I, I want to give you the final thoughts on this thing, and then I was going to to you know do some book recommendations and plugs, and I'm also hoping we can get you to play some banjo if you have it handy. Is it around? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, because yeah, I think that's a possibility. Okay, cool. So, a- any final thoughts on this whole topic of effort and and turning it into something, talking about it in a way that's a little bit more interesting and compelling? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, we've sort of been a lot of it's been kind of philosophical, I think, but I think really what it boils down to in sort of concrete real world terms is that I know people, you know, people, you know, within the comics industry, within the art community, people who have this tremendous amount of raw talent. Okay. You know, we're not saying talent isn't a thing that doesn't exist. I mean, certainly some people have a facility that other people don't. You know, they, they have a certain, you know, their brain, their their hand-eye coordination, whatever it is. But people who have a tremendous amount of talent or skill but no drive, and they never, ever go as far as someone who has maybe less skill or less magical gemstone talent, but they just, they just keep going. They just, they have the drive and they just, they just go, go, go. And those people always go farther. Yeah. You know, it's talent helps, but it is not everything. The drive and the work is everything. And really, I feel like, you know, I've told students this, so much of it is just sticking around, just sticking to it. And that eventually, you know, you'll make it. You'll be the last man standing and you'll you'll make it if you just stick with it long enough. And understand that could be five years, 10 years, 15 years, 30 years. Who knows? Uh, I'm already dropping your class. No. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> don't let the door. Right <laughs> oh, Zach, I always love talking with you. Uh, Likewise. Uh, I don't know if you had any book recommendations, but I got a couple. First of all, um, if you want to read something by somebody who actually does stick with it and sticks with it hard, no matter how dark it gets, because sometimes that's where the best stuff is created is in your, you know, your darkest hour. Uh, if you haven't read it yet, check out Roxo from First Second Books. I mean, it's been out for a while now. When did this come out? A couple years ago? Yeah. 2012. 2012. My about signed copy is from October of 2012. So really about two years ago. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a terrific, terrific book. If you are a fan of excellent comic book storytelling, uh, wonderful fantasy settings, cool drama, cool character development, uh, really good buddy story. Uh, you could do your shipping in this if you want to, but guess what? You could also just read it as a buddy story and it's really good. 
Uh, and the other one I want to give a shout out to, and I know he was just on the show recently, is Picks by my buddy Greg Schiegel. Yes, he is my buddy. Yes, I blurbed the book. I blurbed the book not because he's my buddy, but because I believe in the book. And this is a superhero story for young people or the young at heart. And uh, I'll just read Chris G. Russo's um, blurb on the back because I think he sums it up beautifully. He says, people say there are no superheroes for girls. What they really want is a famous girl superhero. Give Pix 50 years to establish yourself and then jump on the bandwagon or be one of the cool people who reads it now. Uh, it, it is. It's, it's everything people are clamoring about, like with more female representation in comics and in sp specifically superhero comics. And it's also just really well-crafted superhero comic storytelling. He takes full advantage of the, you know, the rhythms of the page. And really, and this is going to sound nerdy, but it's really great uh, you know, word, word picture ratio, which I love to see in comics. He's not trying to tell a cinematic story. He's trying to tell a comic story. So that's at PixComic.com uh, is where you can get that. So, Zach, did you have any uh, recommendations? I did. And you know what? I was thinking about graphic novels, but I actually decided to go with um, a floppy comic for this one. What? They still make those? They still make them. I don't know if you've read the lumberjanes or heard of lumberjanes i have yeah i'm loving this i'm yeah. loving this series this is i think this is the most recent one this is number seven um and i'm sure you know they will you know collect them if, if you want to you know not pick up issues and read them and I, if they if they do i'm sure they will i hope they don't collect them like just like four issues i hope they do a nice chunk like six issues maybe eight issues something like that but um what a fun comic it's about this like group of girls who are kind of um, it's kind of like a Girl Scouts, but they the the world is not I don't know it's sort of a realistic world, but there's fantasy elements to it. It's you got to just read it. It's 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 a lot of fun, and I got to say, Boom, the publisher is like really knocking it out of the park in terms of of yes, they do Adventure Time and Steven Universe and all of those properties, but putting out original properties, you know, like a new characters, new stories and ideas. They're, they're doing some really awesome stuff over there. So I, I definitely recommend picking that up. Yeah, uh, that's that's uh, spearheaded by Noel Stevenson of Nimona. Yeah. And, Who we uh, mentioned, yeah. Yeah, um, and then it is the, but there's a fleet of other artists involved with this thing. Well, Brooke Allen, I think, is the main artist, but she's drawing um, from Noel's designs. right. Right. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, really fantastic. And then my second recommendation is a book that I'm actually just starting. I haven't finished. And th this is an older book that I picked up. It's um, Charles in Charge Again. <laughs> and um, boy, I got to say, I mean, this just I, I started reading and I was I was hooked. I cannot wait to see how Charles and Buddy are going to get out of this. One. <laughs> so he is in charge of your days and your nights. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. And it, see, it's saying it's based on the hit TV show, but uh, yeah, man, you know the book is better. <laughs> fantastic! Man, what a thrill! What a thrill! Uh, do you do you actually go? Because like, I know you like you go garage sailing every once in a while, and get some neat things and like yes. nostalgic things. Will you pick up like Quantum Leap books and stuff and actually read them? Um. I will pick them up. I don't know that I actually ever, <laughs> I like to give them to people. Yeah. Like I bought a book about bear attacks and how to avoid them. <laughs> that, that actually sounds like a great book. Cause that's like the number one thing I think about whenever I go camping. I just cannot. I know, right? stop I love and there's a whole book. There's a whole book and th there's more than one step, which isn't just stay away from bears. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Well, I keep forgetting which is the one you're supposed to play dead for and which one you're not, right? It's different from black bear to grizzly bear. So, uh, I, The one I, thing I remember is a, a black bear can climb a tree, but a grizzly bear can't. So if you climb a tree and a black bear's after you, it's going to climb up okay. right after you. But okay. a grizzly bear can't. As a sedentary cartoonist, I'm screwed either way. So. Yeah, you know what? Just play dead. That's the easiest. <laughs> and hope for the best. I just I just carry I carry pepper spray when I'm in the woods and I carry a bear bell and then I just I just hope for the best. There you uh, go. But uh, okay, so is it possible that we can uh -huh. hear a little banjo from the multi talented Zach Giolongo? Um, I'm very nervous about this. My stomach is all. Oh, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to so. contribute to your anxiety. If well, okay, but actually, this is perfect. I don't know if I don't know if you thought about this, but this is perfect. Banjo is not something that I have a talent for this is something that i'm learning how to do and i have to practice and i'm not that great yet yeah. but you know i'm trying 
So that's cool. I just happen to have it right here. <laughs> <laughs> it's just always within oh, arm's reach because you never know when you gotta do a few rolls. Right. All right. So we're in a modal key here. I'll take your word for it. Does it sound okay yeah. through there? Yeah. All right. And this song called Cluck Old Hen. Now, this would be the point where the audience would all be roaring if we were doing it in front of a live, live studio audience. That was great. Oh, thank you. See, you, you set me up to just hear, like, my dog has fleas, you know? I wasn't expecting something with, like, real rolls and chords and things. Oh, uh, a little more bluegrass. That was pretty good. Oh, wow. How uh, long have you been playing? I'm trying. Um... So I started playing about five years ago, and I started learning chords and things like that. And then... I went for a long time without a teacher. And then just recently, like in March or so, I said, you know what? I can't get any farther on my own without a teacher. So I found someone and I just started, you know, I go once a week and, you know, started learning how to actually play claw hammer style. Oh, that's great. And I'm still working. I'm still working on it. <laughs> oh, you, you make me want to go back to trying to learn an instrument because I think, I think every artist should have, you know, some kind of musical expression as well. Uh, well, you know, the thing that I've found with it and why I would really recommend an instrument is it's creative in a different way. And it's also not I, it's something that I'm doing purely for its own sake. I don't you know, I'm not looking to be a professional banjo player. Right. Just doing it for the pleasure of doing it. And that's it. Which is a way to center oneself. Right. Uh, yeah. Which I mean, I know that sounds new agey and goofy, but it's. For me, it's vital. I cannot perform at well as an illustrator if I'm not centered and focused on the work Absolutely. that I'm doing. So. You need other outlets. Yeah. Wow, Zach. Let's do this again. Sometime. Definitely. Okay, great. And uh, I can call you on my dino phone. <laughs> <laughs> had to get the joke in there. Uh, I got a couple plugs to throw out. Uh, people should go out and pick up the Stratford uh, Zoo uh, Midnight Review. Yes. Uh, Scottish play. Yes. Uh, we'll link to it in the show notes. And uh, anything else that people should be watching for from you, Zach? I have a, um, I believe it's the title is just Star Wars Doodles. Uh, it's a Star Wars Doodle book that um, I'm finishing up now, and I think will be out in March. I'm not sure. So it's one of these kind of like fun activity books of like, you know, you're given a drawing prompt, all Star Wars related, and you have to... Oh, you know, man. Put your own creative heart into it. Oh, that is exciting. I cannot wait to dig into that because I will be doing all of the exercises of that book. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, I actually, one of, one of my hobbies is collecting coloring books. And I love, you know, finding like old, rare, weird coloring books. And I love the games inside of them. So, Perfect. Well, I think cool. you'll like this one then. Oh, awesome. Star Wars Doodles. We will watch for that. Uh, a couple things going on in Ann Arbor, everybody. Tiny Expo is coming up December 13th, 2014. TinyExpo.com. Uh, applications are open until November 10th. Now, what is Tiny Expo? It's an arts and crafts show, kind of like the Detroit Urban Craft Fair, kind of like, uh, you know, all of these uh, Etsy DIY maker things. I have spoken in the past about how, as a cartoonist, uh, it, I do very well at these shows because you stand out. You're not just one of many comic books there. You are just one of many arts and crafts things there. And the people who come to those things are actually there to discover new stuff. 
So I wind up selling very well when I take my mini comics to that. And that, that it's going to be held at the Ann Arbor District Library. So now they're doing two festivals a year between Kids Read Comics and the Tiny Expo. So that's tinyexpo.com. Applications are only open until November 10th. No exceptions. And then Wednesday, November 19th, 6 to 8 p.m. at Mallet's Creek Branch, we're going to be holding another edition of the Web Comics Lab where you can get access to different comics tools, web comics making tools, and uh, just, you know, uh, kibitz with other uh, local cartoonists and the stuff that we make in the lab is eligible to be included on the Ann Arbor District Library's upcoming web comics site. So uh, that's at uh, aadl.org. You can look in the events uh, listings, but it's Wednesday, November 19th, 6 to 8 p.m. at the Mallets Creek Branch. I'll be there. Come hang out with us and let's talk about web comics. And then one last thing. This is a bit of a self-serving thing uh, in a way. Uh, I'm the artist of the RoboForce comic from Toyfinity, the company that's making the new RoboForce toys. And if, if you are a fan of 80s cartoons and toys as I am, uh, you can go read the comic. But most importantly, uh, they're finally releasing a classic Max Steel, well, Max Zero now figure uh, with the with the classic paint scheme. And it's up, up for pre-order at Toyfinity.com. Uh, if anybody who's been following this has seen that Max has come out with a bunch of different color iterations, but the classic Max in the, the off-white with the blue and red and yellow is finally being released. But you got to pre-order, and that's at Toyfinity.com. I don't get any money out of that deal. Uh, I just want to support the guys who are supporting me by letting me draw their – or hiring me to draw their RoboForce comics. So, all right. Let's get out of here, Zach. Thanks again. Jersey, also congrats on Boulder and Fleet. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I'm doing a webcomic. <laughs> <laughs> Boulderfleet.com if you like to watch bears and birds uh, eat things. That's what's going to be going on for the next couple of weeks in the comics. It's just a big, long eating scene before the fight scene. So, uh, But yeah, yeah, it's, it's on Tapastic and Instagram and Twitter. Uh, thank you, Zach, for bringing that up. I forgot. Uh, so the show will be archived at comicsgreat.com slash CAG106. If you enjoyed this discussion, a great thing you can do is, first of all, go follow Zach on Tumblr at zachulees.tumblr.com. Then you can go to iTunes, give the show a star review, however many stars you think it deserves. You don't have to write a full review. Although when you write a re review, that's very nice, and I read them, and they make me very happy. Uh, and if you're watching this on YouTube, give the video a thumbs up. That helps more people find the show. Uh, with that... I will say thank you to Matt Dubay and Eric Kloster in the control room for putting on this show with, uh, over and over and over again. Thank you to Zach Giolongo of ZachUlees.tumblr.com for being a fantastic guest. And uh, thank you guys for downloading, watching, and listening. And until next time, I've been Jersey Drozd of ComicsGreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. Okay, bye.